I'm glad to be here with you and to, to initiate this first podcast. So welcome back. Hi, Povi. Hi, Julia. Nice to see you. And today we talk in chapter one. We are happy to present the chapter one about uh, the topic we live in a world full of controllers. Yes. So the topic controlling, controlling not only in the business sense, but also controlling in the daily life will accompany, accompany us in chapter one. Before starting in, in the philosophical way of that, I think I would like to, to give a short introduction. What does it mean and what do we mean with the topic or with the term controller? Now, what I have learned in the past is, and also through my uh, meditation practice, also Vipassana, which is now not Bhagavad Gita, but they are very close. If you look at the Buddhism and the Hinduism, they are very, very close in the in the essence, in the spiritual uh, path, if you look at both of them, and they have the same philosophy at the end. And that, let us start from, from reaction, you know, uh, how, why we people as humans, we always react. How can we react? Since our five senses, but also the sixth sense is our mind, um, that is always busy, that when we see something, we react. If we smell something, we react. We hear, we, we taste, we touch, or we think about something. We always react. And about, from this reaction, let, let's take about the positive or negative reaction. doesn't matter. We always think that we can control everything. I see something, I look at the watch, I say, okay, um, at this and that time, the plane goes, I have to be on time at the airport, I have to be on time at the bus station. Um, if I plan everything in future, this and that will happen. And I think this is also a very linear way of thinking, which is very much appropriate for the Western way of thinking. And I, I also get right now the link to the intercultural part of what I'm doing, because I always discuss uh, with, with my participants in intercultural trainings that the Indians, for example, they don't plan. And after the years, I realized, and when I learned about the different cultural dimensions, you call them, that, for example, the Western world is a very, that's the red line through the Western world, not all the countries, but the red line through the Western world is a very, uh, uh, are very linear cultures. That means what I explained in the beginning, if I plan and if I do step one, step two will happen and so on. And if I plan accordingly, in five years, I will have my this and that growth that we have planned as a, as a, as a company. And this is something we can control. And, and what I have learned also from my upbringing and what I've learned now, uh, the more and more I looked into detail from the, from the cultural part of the Indian way of thinking is that nothing is linear. We cannot control anything. So it's very interesting to see that it's called the polychronic world in the Asian countries, you know, the polychronic is more the Asian world where the people do many things at once and we cannot control anything and so on. Now, if we if we if we consider very much into the death that actually nothing can be controlled what does that mean because we are only observers of our deeds and we are only observers of that what is happening the best example is right now corona are we able to control anything i think no we are trying our very level best to do that and we think we have it we have it under control and if you look at the world, how it is dealing with it, there are no structures that say that's the best way to deal with it. And I think that is something which shows us that controlling does not really work with humans. Sorry, now you start. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's very interesting because I have the feeling we are actually lying to ourselves and, and making life harder by believing that we can control things. So controlling means that we get used to it and that the moment something other happens we have we have no no idea how to deal with it then because the control we've created is is just like a like a recipe i like to do sports like as example and i'd like to do any sports and i i like to create obstacles that might make me fall down but i always understand if i'm not falling 
I, I'm not learning how to fall and I'm not learning how to get up. So if we want to control everything and make our life very easy, then we might not fail anymore, not fall anymore a long, long way. But at one moment, because life is not linear, because life is just a, a kaleidoscope. It's, it's, there are so many coincidences, like as you talked about COVID. Um, something happens which was not predicted by us, which is not to be controlled with the knowledge we have gained until now. So all of a sudden, everything we thought which we had under control, we have not under control. So in these means, I believe that controlling without being controlling is a much more efficient way of um, being able to cope with what this world has to offer for us. It's true. But my question is, um, how can you get there not to control? Because if I look at myself and my process, which I have uh, gone through the last 10 years, and I, I love to show you my examples, my personal examples, and also with others who have gone through their development. As I said in the, in the introduction, development is a very uh, important topic, is that I really struggled very hard because very often people say, yeah, you have to let go, stop controlling. I said, yes, but how? You know. So this is a process which I have learned. I think many people are aware that it is time to change something and we cannot control, but many people are not aware of how to get into action to let go. So maybe I can try. There's this Buddhist saying, we only own the moment. So some of us have heard this before, and um, there are also these people who say we get born into this world naked and we leave the world naked. We are not taking anything with us. So does accumulation, does control, does ownership makes any sense then? And what is actually the meaning of, of having a status of owning something, of controlling something? These are all these questions um, I think there are and likes or friends or, you know, we cannot own them, we cannot control them. And um, because, you know, this world is changing every minute, how can we connect intuition and mind? How can we um, balance heart and mind, as you like to say? How can we control this changing world without being in control. I mean, this is really, this question is a big question. And I myself like to refer to someone who is called Till Eulenspiegel. Till Eulenspiegel is a, is a figure from where I come from. I'm born in Braunschweig. And this guy was very, very um, driven by his intuition. And he used to cry when he walked down the hill because he knew, oh, I need to walk up the hill soon. And when he walked up the hill, he was laughing because he knew one day he would be allowed to walk the hill down again. So if so, then we can imagine every problem we have, every challenge we face, every illness, every disaster to be just a lesson in life, which makes us stronger, which allows us to then being the controllers of our lives. So the moment we go through something which we cannot control, we learn something for controlling it the next time. Um, this sounds a little bit weird, but in these means, I think it is very, very important for us to be resilient, to be within ourselves, to be trusting, to understand that everything which is happening here on this place called Earth is happening for some kind of a reason. And we are here to learn something and if we are not going through things that we cannot control, then we can never learn how to control. So why don't we see the beauty in it? The less we expect, the more we get in the end. I think these are like messages which if we repeat them, we can, we can maybe um, start changing this notion of controlling by controlling into controlling by letting go. Yeah, true. Um, I would like to pick up the, the point with Till Eulenspiegel you said, because from the, from the ancient wisdom, from the eastern part of the world, it is said the moment he was walking down and looking, uh, was crying to, because he had to, someday he had to walk up again, is not to live in the moment, you know? So because the moment you walk down, you consider, I am walking down. 
And if we talk about resilience, it, I think it is exactly that what we shall le learn right now. Not to think, and that is what you learn in, while meditation, that what you learn, what meditation brings in, in the Hinduism, in Bhagavad Gita, in Vipassana, the, the Buddhism, and so on. It says, you cannot keep away or, or uh, keep away the negative things from you, and can, you cannot stuck on the positive things. The only thing is you can observe. And that's what I meant with the senses that always, uh, yeah, are a little bit tricky to us, you know, because we were conditioned to react all the time. What you learn, for example, in meditation, whatever kind of meditation people like to do, you know, it's um, uh, either you sit on the pillow, the actual meditation takes place in, in real life, that is a fact, but it helps to train your muscle, which is called brain, a little bit better to say, Whatever thoughts come, because when you sit and meditate, the, the, sixth, my, the sixth sense at the end, the mind, is always busy. And I, I think especially, not only in the Western world, I see that in India too, people are too busy, are too... The first thing what we have to learn is to empty our minds and to understand that we don't know anything. And the moment we realize that we don't know anything, something new can emerge from, from very deep inside. Because once this is a little bit switched off, I'm not saying knock it out, for sure not, because there is a reason why we have that. And it's a wonderful tool to have. And I would be very sad if we didn't have our brain, frankly speaking. But what is getting a little bit neglected in our world, and we learned that from the ancient... Um, from the ancient wisdoms also from 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 uh, the eastern part but it is also getting lost there if you see how the people live there but it is saying listen to your heart reminds me of the of the song of roxette <laughs> listen to your heart and it is it is something which helps you to not understand in the sense of understand here from the brain but understand from your heart that there is also some sensor or some, something that can guide you. The guidance comes not from the brain, the guidance comes from very deep within. And frankly speaking, it took me over 10 years to understand that, or actually more than 10 years, because I, my upbringing and my way of thinking was very much brain oriented. And when I started um, having also physical pains and all that, and people said, Puvi, stop thinking uh, from, from outside or from, from just from the symptoms we are having, go more into the deeper level. And these were people from the Western part of this world yeah, telling me that. Yes, and still I think both is important. You know, um, we, we cannot only let us lead from the inside because True. there also is an outside. I mean, and, and this is, I'm saying that, whoa, because, you know, I usually always say go within, but um, we are human beings and we like, you know, to go into these extremities. Now we need to think inside and everybody goes inside, but then, you know, we, we, not, we don't need to lose the connectedness into the outside world. So it is very important to sort of balance being inside and being outside and letting them communicate and speak with each other. This is just what I, what I want to add here, because control is, is an inner voice of us and all our inner voices are welcome to be there and they're welcome to be integrated. And letting go is just another, um, or you know, being in the moment is just another, I think we can be all at once, being the past which brought us here, being the future which we are creating with the moment. So we can also look to the future, we can look back to the past, but we can still be in the moment. And I, I think this, um, this balance is the greatest challenge of all. Yes. And I totally agree with you that um, from, from the integral part of it, as you know, that I'm also um, looking very much into that model of Ken Wilber, the integral um, uh, map, it is always important to include both and to include the, 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 the external part, the internal part, the individual, and of course the, the, the systemic part, the collectivistic part. But I think it is also important to point out where the extremities are right now. The extremities are that we have one side too much looking from outside of the external part and neglecting the internal part. 
And we have movements that are focusing too much on the internal part and neglecting the outer part. And exactly, I totally agree, the balance can only be created if you look at both together and worship and, and, and say thank you to that both exist. And the moment we, we connect both, we will understand that the definition of controlling what we have till now, because it's more a definition that comes from, from outside to control something, we can control from outside, but the controlling from inside is as much valuable as that what we know till now. And those who have experienced it already to that there is an, another control system that comes from within and many things are or most of the things or actually everything is created through us i, I like this this uh, for those who just listen to it will not see my my gesture right now but through us it doesn't mean, mean through me personally but through me without me it could not exist but i'm just a catalyst a catalyst nothing else so through this catalyst something can be created yeah so i think to to understand that that uh, con the, as you said it's one of our many voices we have within us it is um we have another voice it's called creativity and sometimes it's good to have the controller within us say now creativity be a little bit calm i have i found many many new ideas and i will stick to this and that and the others i noted them down but they are not important right now it's very important to have that inner control and while you talk about it, I, I must think about this linear way you talked about before again and about, you know, we need to have an outcome of the actions we take and, you know, we are in control of it because we are expecting something in the end. And um, in terms of Gaia, we like to talk about the so-called Gaia salary. So this annual goal we are always thinking about when we talk of an organization who has a strategy plan and stuff, this annual goal, when you let go of control happens along the way that means there are no expectations and the so-called gaia salary then is something we get anyway maybe even better than we would have expected but we don't know what we would have expected and this actually i think having an organization being a, an owner of, of of some kind of a company is a very very dangerous thought you know, how can I let go of control in, in terms of having no annual goal in mind and still trusting in the outcome might be okay for me and for the world. So I think this is the hardest part of letting go of control. Yes. And um, yeah, uh, the growth, as uh, we said, I think in the introduction of, of uh, this, this series here, is that growth is endless. So if, if companies and the leaders of the companies understand that um, if, if, if this is the only goal they have, it is not in the sense of Gaia, it's not, in this, it's, it's not for the planet, it's not for the humans, it's just actually for their own ego. <laughs> and about the ego we'll be also be talking about. Um, I think this is, uh, can be given to, um, an extra chapter <laughs> about the ego. If we really want to have a sustainable planet, a, a, a planet that where further generations can live on, we have to have kind of Gaia salary. Can you explain that a little bit? What maybe in few sentences, what does Gaia salary mean? So the, the listener can understand that. Yes. So number one, the Gaia salary comes along the way with us. So it can be anything from a good quality soil on which we grow our food over a healthy air we breathe up to friendships, a joyful life, um, a joyful togetherness among people, drinkable water on a daily basis. So the Gaia salary also might mean that we are learning a lesson that we have just passed um, at the next class and er, have a certificate in life, you know, which is not a certificate um, um, we can see. We are rewarded with a good life. Yeah. I, I, I might sound a little bit romantic and that yeah. we are not very realistic. Yeah. Um, I would also like to emphasize that we are not, or especially me and I know you too, Julia, um, we live in a system where money is important and i don't think so it makes sense to live without money okay because the system is like that but
But if we consider mo money only as the only thing that is a reward for us, then as we see right now, it is a problem. Yeah. Yes. So the yes. question at the end is how can we merge the economical interests with, with the interests of Gaia and with the interests of further or, or the future gener generations. And this is where we are looking for. So I also want to really emphasize that we are not romantic people and say we all are, we all are one, yes, for sure. I deeply be believe in that. And we can just live um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with few things we can. But right now it doesn't sound so realistic because I, what I learn right now, people are not ready really ready to give up certain things. I have looked at shared value approaches, right? And I have looked at them a lot. So yes, I'm not romantic. And I have seen the idea of having all stakeholders included. Yeah, all stakeholders being, of course, um, also the capitalism, the economy, um, also nature and so on. But I see that when we do these shared value approaches, we look up on the world from our perception, from our um, idea on how life is, our projection. We do not look from what might Gaia want to say? What does the other stakeholder really want? You know, we are not listening to the stories of the others. And yes, being romantic, yes or no, but the Gaia salary in the end, and it can be with or without money, but the Gaia salary then is a good life for all. And this is not right. romantic. And stakeholder is wonderful, a uh, wonderful word, a wonderful term you're using. Um, putting yourself into the shoes of others, that's what we do, for example, in constellation work, for those who know what constellation work is, is a very important thing. And it helps you really to, to uh, look from the other's point of view and not only from what you want. And that's exactly what you are emphasizing right now. And I think um, that would be the right path to go. So getting the link again to, to the topic of controlling, yeah, is exactly what, what it means. You're still under control, but let few things go and let it emerge from within. And then uh, the, the quality of controlling would be something totally different. So it's about the quality of controlling, I think so. My, my perception of that what we have discussed right now. I'm very glad that you made the link to the topic of control because I think yes. we need to let our audience go and, yes. um, and um, let them be curious for the next episode. Yes, looking forward to and uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, same here. Bye. <laughs> Bye, see you.